Now this man is able to see, and as he's able to look around, suddenly the work of God is working through this man to show the blindness of everybody else who's around. And it shows a blindness which occurs even today. Would you believe me if I told you today that it's possible you're blind? And you'd say, no, preacher, I can see you. But it's possible that you're blind. And so let's go through this chapter and see if we can see not only physically, but also spiritually. Are you able to see what God has placed in front of you? And so as we go to our next slide, we look at verses 13 through 17, and we see men who are blinded by tradition. The Pharisees hear about this. Oh, no, here we go. And they begin looking at this man who was born blind and blind all these years, and now he's able to see. And he sees that he's rejoicing, and his family is rejoicing, and everybody who knows him is happy. Everybody is excited because this is the greatest day of this man's life. The Pharisees say, you know it's the Sabbath. And you know we have rules about the Sabbath, don't you? You know that we've made rules saying that you cannot make mud because muds work. And here's Jesus spitting on the ground, making this mud, putting it here. We know we have rules about how you're not able to walk to the pool of Siloam because that's further than what we consider a day's walk. And so you realize all the sins that you've done. You realize what an absolutely terrible day this is. You realize how wrong this is, don't you? And so as they approach him, they have all these rules. And as they explain these rules to this blind man, how Jesus has done wrong, how he should not be seeing right now, how this is a terrible day, look there in verse 6, 16, excuse me, and they say, so here in all this, what are you going to tell us about Jesus? What's your opinion about him now? Look at verse 17. The blind man, seeing clearly, says, well, obviously he's a prophet. Obviously, he's from God. Obviously, this is a good day because now I can see. You know, traditions of men mess us up even today. The most dangerous phrase that you'll hear, the most dangerous phrase that attacks us spiritually is this. You know, we've always done it this way. This is our tradition this is the way we've always believed. This is the way we've always done. This is who we are. And when we have that idea spiritually, we become calloused. We become covered over. We become blind. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 is so important on this point. In that passage, Peter, writing about the Christian mindset, says, listen, every one of us needs to be able to give an answer for those things which we believe. And we need to do it not in the spirit of cockiness, not in the spirit of pride, but we need to do it in the spirit of gentleness. It is necessary for us to know why we believe what we believe. And it's important for us as Christians to be able to give book and verse, to be able to give a Bible answer to everything which occurs. One of the reasons why some congregations lose many of their children, they've never covered the basics. And people don't know why they believe what they believe. One of the reasons why families have so much trouble staying faithful to God is they don't see the purpose because they've not been properly taught. You and I need to have our eyes opened to what the Bible teaches. You and I need to understand what the scriptures teach and why it is we do what we do. Jesus, earlier speaking to these people, said in Matthew chapter 15, looking there in verse 8 and going through verse 9, he said to these Pharisees, in vain do these people worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Their lips say they honor me, but their hearts are far from me. And as you and I read that passage, we see the importance of not just saying the right thing, but knowing the right thing, believing the right thing, and acting in the right way. 
in the book of Galatians, as the people in Galatia, some of the Jewish Christians, were trying to move those Christians back to Judaism. Paul tells them, if anyone preaches to you a gospel other than what you see in the Bible, let him be accursed. So I've said before, so now I say to you again, even if an angel preaches another gospel, let that person be accursed. Stay faithful to the word of God. There are so many people today who are good people, who are righteous people, sincere people, who are religious people, but they're blind. They don't see that they're far from God because they're worshiping tradition and not God. They're worshiping the ways and the ideas and the creeds of man rather than making Jesus and Jesus only their Lord. John chapter 14 and verse 6. And so this healing of this blind man shows the blindness of the Pharisees. But then we continue along, and now we see in verse 18 through 23, the parents. And as we read there about the parents, we see these people who are blinded by fear. You remember how excited you were the very first time you saw your child walk? You remember how excited you were the very first time your child said your name? Let me give you a trick. They always say dad, dad, rather than mama, even though mama does everything. You remember how exciting it is to see your child excel in sports, perhaps, to walk across that stage at graduation, to get a job and move out. These people had raised a man blind, a man who most likely had to spend his life begging. Very likely, these parents had dropped off their adult son because he had no one else to take care of him. And now this son is healed. Now this son is able to take care of himself. Now the best day, not only for this man's life, but for the parents' life, has occurred. But they're not able to enjoy it. Because rather than seeing what's great, they're blinded by fear. They weren't willing to defend their son. The Pharisees come to, their, to the parents and they say, hey, you know, this happened on the Sabbath and, you know, uh, we don't like Jesus and so uh, we need some help. And so your job is to tell us why this is a bad day, why this is a bad thing. And the parents say, well, you know, our son, he's of age. Ask him. Our son, you know, this is his fault. It's not us. We didn't raise him this way. <laughs> Ask him. Now, it's a preview. John 12 and verse 42. Many people, many people believed in Jesus, but they weren't going to confess it because they're afraid they'll get kicked out of the synagogue. Why is it a big deal to get kicked out of the synagogue? Well, that's where you worship. That's where you find opportunity to work. That is where your cultural center is. If you're out of the synagogue, you're no longer considered a Jew. Gentiles don't want you. Jews don't want you. You pretty much lose everything in life. And the parents are saying, hey, yeah, that's our kid, but we're not touching this with a 10-foot pole. And so even though the greatest day of their life has occurred, they refuse to enjoy it because they're scared. How many of us refuse to enjoy life because we're scared? The great things happen to us in life and we think to ourselves, oh great, everything's good, that means something's about to crash. How many of us know what we need to do to be right with God, but we don't do it because of the crowd. We don't do it because of our parents. We don't do it because we realize the commitment it takes. How many people refuse to obey the gospel? How many people refuse to repent? How many people refuse to make things right with a brother whom they've offended because they're scared. They don't want to go through it. And so therefore they re prefer to remain blind and go through life miserable. 
That's what's happening to these people. Now you read the end of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, the end of that verse. And there Jesus is talking to one of the seven churches. And he says, you know, you're going to go to prison. A lot of you will suffer for my name. A lot of scary stuff is about to happen. But chapter 2, verse 10, be faithful even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of righteousness. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18 tells us that love, perfect love, casts out fear. That our lives cannot be controlled all the time by fear. Now, in Acts 2, Peter used some fearful things, talking about the things they had done, where they cried out and they obeyed. And there's sometimes that fear needs to be preached and fear needs to be found in our heart. But long term, if you're going to be the person God has called you to be, you can't live in fear. You have to live in love. You have to step out into that scary situation and trust God to take care of you. You've got to be willing to live by faith, knowing what's waiting you on the other side. You've got to live for Jesus. Now look down at verse 24 and 34. Here we see a man blinded by pride. The Pharisees are running out of options. They're angry at the healed man because the healed man actually begins quoting scripture. You know, God doesn't hear the prayer of a sinner. So obviously Jesus must be the son of God. Obviously, this man must be a prophet. Otherwise, he could not do God's works. And they come back to him, and they're angry. Verse 28, their pride has just messed them up. They say, well, we are Moses' disciple, and you're the disciple of Jesus. Think about how weird that is, how ironic that is. Moses did nothing but point to Christ. Moses' law did nothing but lead to Christ. And now that Christ is here, their pride says, nope, we're staying in the old way. Nope, the very Son of God is in our presence and he's doing miracles, but we're going to remain miserable. Why? Because of his pride. The blind man who's healed responds to them, but this man were not of God. He could do nothing. How often in our life do we fail because we're too, too big in ourselves, too full of ourselves, too prideful? Proverbs 16, 18, haughtiness comes before the fall. Pride goes before destruction. James chapter 4 and verse 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. It's an interesting picture back in Daniel. And as you go back in Daniel, I think it's around chapter 4, we see Nebuchadnezzar. And the Lord has had a or Daniel's had a dream, the king's had a dream, Daniel interprets it, that Nebuchadnezzar is going to fall. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't really believe it. And one day he's on the city wall and he looks at the the hanging gardens, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He looks at his empire he looks at the gate of Ishtar. He looks at everything he's had. He says, you know, I'm the greatest king who's ever lived. I'm the greatest thing out there. And at that moment, God struck him down. He lived like an animal for years. He ate grass. His hair became like eagle's feathers, like just going all over the place. He grew claws because his nails. He was mentally insane. God caused him to live like a dog. And it was not until in humility he recognized that God was in charge that God restored him. When we look at our lives today, how often do we find ourselves living like a dog? You see, our pride brings forth failure. And when we think we're smarter than everybody else, when we think that we can't be tempted, when we think that we can overpower everything by our own talent, by our own ability, by our own strength, that's when we're struck down. That's when we need to realize it's time to recognize God as God. So often, pride blinds us. 
And many times we need to make a decision for God, but we refuse to because we consider ourselves God. Now, we wouldn't say that, but that's really what we're doing. Many times we need to get things right, but we find ourselves in a way to where we won't change and can't change because of our pride. And it gets us in trouble. Now, lastly, verse 35 through 41, we see the blind man lives by choice. Jesus returns to this blind man who's been healed. And, of course, over and over, the, the healed man, if you look at him, you see his faith growing. Well, nobody could do this unless God be with him. I know that he's a prophet. Yes, he can't be a sinner. He's got to be from God. Verse 35, do you believe? In the Son of God. Imagine Jesus asking you that question. Do you believe in the Son of God? Verse 38, yes, I believe. And he worshiped him. Now remember back in verse 4, I must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. For the night comes when no one can work. This man had an opportunity. An opportunity to make a decision. Imagine how awesome and great it would be to be changed from being blind to being able to see physically. The color yellow. Your parents' eyes. The world. This wall that I've been begging about. At, I've always wondered what it looked like. Look at what all these people look like. Imagine how wonderful that is. But what's even greater is now he can see spiritually. Now he can see Jesus. And now he has hope. You and I are called to make the right choice today. In 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah is talking to the nation of Israel. 400 prophets of Baal over here. And as he's talking to them, he says, you know, it's time to stop wavering. If Baal's God, you follow Baal. If God is God, you follow God, it's time to make a choice. It's time to no longer be blind. It's time now to see. Now, this man made a choice. First, you see the physical choice, and then you see the spiritual choice. Not many of us today would be very high on the idea of allowing somebody to spit on the ground, make mud, and rub it on our eyes. And then having to walk about half a mile to go wash it off. If, if somebody said, hey, you want to have that happen to you? 100% no. There may be a weird person here. 99.9% .9 no. But he made the choice. Because he had no hope. And because he understood the possibility that was there. Many times people say, well, you know, I don't know about baptism. This washing in water. And I know it's required in the Bible, but it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know about this church stuff. This church stuff doesn't make sense to me. I don't know about forgiving people who've done me wrong, about abstaining from fleshly lust. I don't know about this commitment which is here. But today a choice is set before us. Will you be healed from blindness? Will you obey the command that God has given. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, after hearing the gospel, the people cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter responded, repent, be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for yourselves, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Move from darkness to light. Move from being lost to being saved. Move from what you created to what God has in store for you. Doesn't always make sense because we're not God. It's not always easy because it requires obedience. But it's important for us to make that decision while it's day. Because the night approaches for every one of us. 